Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be looking at the two types of active transport. Those are primary active transport, which is what we're going to see first, and then we'll move on to secondary active transport. But before we do that, we really need to have at least a baseline understanding of the orientation of different ions relative to the plasma membrane. So this set of dotted lines right here, this represents the plasma membrane of a cell. So on top of this, now this is the extracellular fluid, or the ECF. So this is outside the cell, fluid outside the cell. The ICF, or intracellular fluid, this is really just the cytosol of the cell. So down here is inside the cell. So notice in this cell, the outside of the cell, the ECF, has a ton of sodium. It's not to say there's no sodium on the inside of the cell, there's a little bit, but there's a vastly higher amount of sodium outside the cell in the ECF. Likewise, in the ICF inside the cell, there's a huge concentration of potassium. That doesn't mean there's no potassium outside the cell, there's a little bit, but most of the potassium is inside the cell. And this is a really important distribution to remember for sodium and potassium. And this is what we would see when a cell is at rest. Now, uh, that means we're at a resting membrane potential. Now, we're really not going to talk about membrane potential here, but we at least want to understand what it means for a cell to be at rest. What does that mean? Well, when a cell's at rest, it really means it's not doing anything, okay? But it can do something if given the proper stimulus, so it is ready for action, okay? So for example, when you have a wild party at your house before the wild party starts, theoretically, your house is in order. Everything is in its proper place, it's clean, right? So all of these ions are in their proper place. So lots of sodium outside the cell, lots of potassium inside the cell. That's what we have at rest. This is before the party. But what happens after the party's over? Well, theoretically, if you had a wild party, you've got stuff all in disarray around the house. Um, you've got cans of drinks in the fish tank. Okay, there's trash everywhere. And so that's kind of represented by what we have here. So in this case on the right, the cell has already taken some action. We don't really need to know what that action is. Um, but again, notice now that these ions are really in the wrong place. Okay, I've got all these potassiums outside of the cell. That's not really where they belong to be at rest. And all the sodiums are on the inside of the cell. Okay, now why is this a problem? Well, once you have this situation where you have a lot of potassium outside the cell and a lot of sodium inside the cell, in order to have another party, you have to reset the membrane potential, meaning you've got to put these ions back in the right place. So what that means is that the sodium is going to somehow have to be moved outside the cell where it belongs, and the potassium is going to have to be moved inside the cell where it belongs. Because if you're going to have a party the next night, theoretically you want it to go back to its clean state. You want your house to be clean, and then you're going to mess it up again. Okay, so understand what it means for a cell to be at rest. Okay, this is the typical orientation of the ions. Lots of sodium outside the cell, lots of potassium inside the cell. It's ready to do something. Okay, and that something generally is an action potential or it could be a number of other things. But after that's over, now you have the wrong distribution of ions and you need to fix it. And the way that you fix this is with one type of active transport. This type of primary active transport is the sodium potassium pump. Now, there's a lot of examples of primary active transporters. We're just using this one as a specific example to demonstrate primary active transport because it's very well studied, okay? So after the party's over, we've got potassium in the wrong place. We've got sodium in the wrong place. We need to flip these. We need to put the sodium outside of the cell, and we need to put the potassium inside the cell. And so this protein right here, which is the sodium potassium pump, also called the sodium potassium, potassium ATPase, is going to flip these ions into the right position. So the first step in the sodium potassium pump mechanism is that three sodium ions are going to bind to specific binding sites on the antiporter. Now, when I say the term antiporter, what I mean is that the net effect of this protein is that the ions are going to move in opposite directions. Think about it. 
the potassiums are going to move inside the cell and the sodiums are going to move outside the cell. So these respective ions are moving in the opposite directions. That makes it an antiporter. Um, we'll see a symporter later on. A symporter, they would move in the same direction. Okay? And with the sodium potassium pump, it's always three sodiums. So let's watch that. There's our three sodiums. They're attaching to specific binding sites on this protein. Now the second step, which we're about to see, is that the phosphate from adenosine triphosphate is transferred to a specific amino acid on the protein. Okay? So here's our reaction. ATP, which is our energy currency of the cell, it's going to transfer a phosphate onto this protein. Okay? Now when that happens, the products are ADP and then the phosphate, which is now attached to the protein, the antiporter. Okay? Um, and again, if you think about recombining these, you would end up back with ATP. So ATP transfers that phosphate onto the antiporter, which is the sodium potassium pump, and ADP is your product, or waste product, as we would say. Okay? Now when that phosphate gets transferred onto the sodium potassium pump, it energizes that sodium potassium pump. And by energize, what we mean is it provides energy to change the conformation of this protein. So the antiporter, or if you want to call it the sodium potassium pump in this case, changes conformation and it expels these sodium ions into the extracellular fluid. Well, that's pretty handy because that's where we want them for the cell to go back to being at rest, its initial state. So now what we're going to have is we're going to have two potassium ions bind to other specific sites on this protein. Okay, so watch this. So these potassium ions are going to bind to their specific sites. But notice it's two potassiums. So three sodiums, two potassiums. Now the next step, we're going to see this. The phosphate right here is going to be hydrolyzed off. It's going to be removed from the amino acid to which it's attached. Okay? And whenever this phosphate is hydrolyzed off, that's going to provide some energy, which is going to allow this protein to change conformations again to its original conformation. So let's watch this. So that phosphate's going to be hydrolyzed off, just floats away, and then the protein's again going to change conformation. And the net effect of that is these two potassiums are going to move into the cell. Okay, so this is the mechanism of the sodium potassium pump. Now, one other thing, I also said it was called the sodium potassium ATPase. The reason it's called a sodium potassium ATPase as well is because the net reaction of this is also to hydrolyze ATP. Now it occurs in separate steps, but notice the ATP transfers that phosphate first to the protein, right, generating ADP, and then later on in this mechanism, once we get the ions in the proper place, that phosphate gets hydrolyzed off as a free phosphate. And so ATP, the net effect, is complete hydrolysis into ADP and phosphate. And also, in terms of these ions for the sodium potassium pump, we move three sodium ions from the inside of the cell to the extracellular fluid where they belong at rest, and we move two potassiums from the extracellular fluid inside the cell, again, where they belong at rest. And that's really going to be how primary active transporters work. They are going to directly use ATP. And by directly use ATP, generally, going back to this step once again, they're going to all transfer phosphate onto that protein, and it's going to trigger a change in conformation. That is how primary active transporters work. Okay? Different primary active transporters might deal with different ions. Some may not use sodium and potassium. There's another example that we use calcium and hydrogen ions. But if it's a primary active transporter, it will directly use ATP, as you see here. Okay? So let's go ahead and skip ahead now to secondary active transport. Now how is secondary active transport different than primary? Well we said primary directly uses ATP, secondary does not directly use ATP. In fact uh, in this example this blue box right here this is going to be our secondary active transporter. And when we look at how it works we're going to see that it never once uses ATP. 
So what does it use? Well, it actually uses the energy provided by the primary active transporter. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's go through again very quickly and review the function of this primary active transporter. In this example, it's the sodium potassium pump. Okay, so remember three sodium ions bind and then ATP is going to transfer a phosphate to the protein, to the sodium potassium pump, and that provides that primary energy to change its conformation, allowing those three sodiums to move into the extracellular fluid. Now for the purpose of the secondary active transporter, I'm going to move these sodiums over here, but that doesn't matter for the function of the primary transporter. Now these two potassium ions are going to attach to their binding sites, the phosphate is going to be hydrolyzed off. You get that last change in conformation and the potassium ions are going to move into the cell. Okay, now why is that important? Well, think about what the primary active transporter did here. This sodium potassium pump, there's a lot of them, and they are maintaining high sodium in the extracellular fluid. They're also maintaining high potassium in the intracellular fluid, but for the purpose of uh, this example talking about the secondary active transporter, this sodium potassium pump is maintaining high sodium in the extracellular fluid. What would happen if we killed this sodium potassium pump? We inhibited all of them. Well, we would no longer be able to get sodium out here. And so there'd be a ton of sodium in the cell, a ton of potassium outside the cell, but we wouldn't have the ions in the right place. So this sodium potassium pump is maintaining the sodium out in the extracellular fluid. So now for what a secondary active transporter does. It's gonna move one substance down its concentration gradient, and it's gonna move the other substance against its concentration gradient, okay? In this example, the substance that's being moved against its concentration gradient is glucose. So GLC is the abbreviation for glucose. If left to its own devices, glucose will never cross into this cell. Okay? It just won't. It will not cross into this cell. However, sodium will. Because if sodium is high out here in the extracellular fluid and low in the intracellular fluid, well then sodium can passively move down its concentration gradient from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid. Okay? That movement from high to low concentration being passive and down its concentration gradient releases energy. Whereas if glucose moves against its concentration gradient, that would require energy. Hmm, well if this requires energy, that's pretty handy because the sodium moving down its concentration gradient releases energy. So it turns out the energy released by the passive movement can fuel the active movement, okay? That energy released by the passive movement is absorbed by the active movement and it allows the active movement to take place. This process is called energy coupling, where the favorable movement, in this example, sodium, it's moving passively, confers energy to move an unfavorable substance, for example, glucose here, against its concentration gradient. Okay? Again, if glucose is left to its own devices, it will never get across here because it's active movement. However, if you combine that movement with another passive movement that releases energy, well, that energy release can be more than enough to move that other substance across. That's energy coupling, and that's how all secondary active transporters work. So it's active transport wide because glucose is moving actively against its concentration gradient. But it does not use ATP directly. It uses ATP indirectly. How is it indirect? Well, remember, this secondary active transporter is reliant on sodium being high out here. Well, how did sodium get out here? The sodium potassium pump, which directly uses ATP. Okay. So sometimes you'll hear this, that secondary active transporters uh, will indirectly use ATP, but really what they're using is a concentration gradient that was already established by a primary active transporter. So let's actually watch this happen. So again, glucose moved actively, sodium is moved passively, and 
And so when sodium moves, that movement will release energy and be more than enough to help glucose move across the membrane. Now, this is an example of symport because as you remember, these two substances are moving in the same direction. They're both moving from the ECF into the ICF. We can also look at an antiporter. Uh, this is a secondary active transporter that is an antiporter. It's going to work the same way. Okay? We're also relying on this sodium potassium pump. What is the sodium potassium pump doing? It's keeping sodium high in the extracellular fluid. Now, normally calcium is also high in the extracellular fluid. Okay? Calcium is also low in the intracellular fluid. So what this exchanger does, the sodium-calcium exchanger, is it allows calcium to be moved actively from the inside of the cell out of the cell. Why is that active? Well, it's moving from low concentration in here to high concentration out here. And again, if left to its own devices, calcium will never by itself do that. But what if I can couple this active or unfavorable movement of calcium with a passive favorable movement of sodium. And that's exactly what we have here. So this sodium calcium exchanger, it does not directly use ATP. What it's going to use is this concentration gradient of sodium that was established by the primary active transporter, the sodium potassium pump. Again, for this argument, potassium is irrelevant. So sodium is going to passively move down its concentration gradient. That movement is going to release energy, which is pretty handy because then that released energy can be picked up by the calcium movement and can be used to move it from the inside of the cell out of the cell. Again, another example of energy coupling. And so we can watch that happen. So sodium is going to move into the cell. That releases energy and then that released energy can fuel the active movement of calcium from the inside out. So when you're looking at a secondary active transporter, there's always one passive movement and one active movement. In this example, the calcium is the active movement and the sodium is the passive movement. Passive movement releases energy, that released energy can fuel the active movement of the other substance across the membrane. And this one is an example of antiport because these two ions are moving in opposite directions, okay? So, bottom line, primary active transport directly uses ATP. Secondary active transport uses a pre-existing concentration gradient that was established by the primary active transporter. And then the secondary active transporter, as you can see right here, has one passive movement, and again, that passive movement is established by the primary active transporter, and that's coupled with an active movement. And that energy released from the passive movement fuels the active movement. So hopefully this video gives you a decent understanding of active transport and the differences between primary and secondary. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.